What am I going to do now, Lord? Hello, Nate-san. Oh, hello, Reverend Mafune. I hope I'm not interrupting your prayers. Far be it for me to come between you and Kami-sama. No, it's fine. I could use someone to talk to anyway. I like the chapel's new music, by the way. You can thank OCR Remix for that. Iwamatsu-san, Takakura-san, and myself search long and hard for music that would appeal to all our parishioners and put them in reverent moods. Can't go wrong with Final Fantasy X. Indeed. But I don't normally see you in the morning, let alone just before you broadcast. And I don't normally see you open carrying a katana. I never pegged you as a violent man. I'm not. But with all the recent excitement, I decided it would be wise to have my Mitama no Ken with me. Mitama no Ken? The Sword of the Spirit? I see you've been brushing up on your Japanese. It comes with my job. Of course. But I keep a Kenny with me now in case I must protect others. <laughs> Kenny. You better hope the board doesn't get upset with you. I answer to a much higher power, so I am not worried. Now. What's troubling you? <sighs> Have you been keeping up with MIFV lately? Unfortunately, the holidays are a busy time for the clergy, so I confess I haven't heard your latest episodes. Well, the board and their new executive assistant... Miss Perkins? Yeah, her. She stopped by and told me the board's decision on my proposals for season two of my show. Which included the Heisei Gamera trilogy, correct? Yes. Did they reject it? Not at all. They loved the idea. Then Kami-sama has blessed you. Except they want me to cover all the Gamera movies. Oh, I see. Well, uh, remember the faith of Job, I suppose. Endure the suffering for now until Kami-sama blesses you twofold after six months. Nine months. Nine months of suffering. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know. Hmm. There may yet be a way for you to find joy amidst this trial, as the Apostle James would say. How? Weren't many of those Showa Gamera films riffed on Mystery Science Theater 3000? Yeah, five of them. Watch those with your guests so you can laugh as you slog through them. As Solomon says, a merry heart is good medicine. That's a great idea! I need to get to the studio in ten minutes, but thanks. Keep me in your prayers. Nate-san, Kamisama ga mamo ruyu ni. Live from the KIJU Studios in beautiful Ogasawara, this is The Monster Island Film Vault, Episode 32, The Misties vs. Gamera the Giant Monster. Hello, Kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Nate Marchand, the film curator here on Monster Island, and today we are beginning our second season, and joining me for this momentous occasion are two of not only my favorite people, but two of my original guests on the show, Nick Hayden and Timothy Deal. Oh, hi. Hey. Hey. Nick, fancy seeing I you know. here. I didn't expect. Well, I didn't expect to be here myself, actually. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You guys didn't plan this? No. I invited both of you, but you didn't come on the same thing? Well, I got recruited by this guy in eyeliner, and I rode a submarine to get here. So I don't, I'm don't. i not sure what's going on. Jimmy, what are you getting into now these days? Oh, okay. That wasn't you. I was a little bit concerned, okay? I mean, no judgment here if you're into eyeliner. I'm just saying. No, 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 no. It wasn't him. Like, I mean, maybe it was eyeliner. I don't know. It was... He was a really kind of suave kind of guy, but uh, he said something about like uh, he was recruiting me for some experiment. No, that's not that's not what happened to me at all. Oh, really? No, I was Fio and Rennie. I was going to show him how to use hot air balloons. Oh, by the I, way, people, just so you know, Fio and Rennie are two of his kids. Well, true. And they took off without me. I was just floating around and I ended up here. Wow. And I just crash landed in the trees and everything. Yeah. 
Hmm. Yeah, well, I was not really expecting to get that far off course. Do you think you were like blown here by a gale of some sort? Yeah, I think it was a pretty harsh gale. Well, oh, hi. Well, hi. Hey there, uh, wait, hi. No, I stumbled in here, and there was Tim, and there was you, and I'm like, well. Well, I mean, I did send you the invitation, so, well, I mean, I, if, if, as long as you get here safe, I really don't care. Although, you might want to talk to whoever got you here about safety precautions, and there's probably going to be paperwork that the board is going to make you fill out because you crashed here. Well, I... Uh, we're kind of used to just showing up places and then talking for an hour or so. Our, po- so. our podcast does this kind of thing to us all the time. So it's it's just kind of our lives at this point. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think the first time you guys came here was courtesy of your TARDIS-style podcast, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah probably. It's been a little nicer to us lately, actually. Yeah, we get to go someplace really nice for Christmas. Yeah. For those who don't know, if for whatever reason, this is your first episode of the Monster Island Film Vault, you guys do a podcast called Derailed Trains of Thought. We'll hear a little bit more about that when we get to the end of the Mm -hmm. show for your shameless plugs. Just filling everybody in, just in case. (laughs) Yes, yes. We we live very colorful lives. Yeah. Well, speaking of colorful lives, (laughs) I'm getting to that, Jimmy. We've had... An interesting time here the last month or so here on the island. Oh, some redecorating? You could say that. (laughs) We're still sporting the pink jumpsuits, obviously. That's uh, a complaint I need to file with HR. But yeah, they gave us this weird hippie outfit for us to wear. Yeah, I know. I just went in Rome. Yeah, I question the board's decisions. But... (laughs) <laughs> but no, last month... As long uh, as you guys don't start collecting polar bears, I think you'll be okay. We have plenty of very strange things here. Polar bears is very um, low on the list. We've been places like this. Unless, th- unless someone discovers a polar bear kaiju. Ooh. Then we need to get that here. Uh, good point. We'll send the, the heat team with Nick Totopoulos, no relation, okay. to, I'm glad. <laughs> to bring them in. I think they do that a lot. But all that to say... Well, I'll explain this a little bit more as we go, but uh, Godzilla and Kong got a little bit, uh, shall we say, rowdy last month when I had Matt and Grattan from the Giant Monster BS podcast on. And yes, the BS stands for exactly what you think it does, Ben Shapiro. But, <laughs> fight me, Matt and Grattan. But, <laughs> so they got started getting a little bit rowdy. Jimmy then decided that he was going to take care of it himself. And if you're wondering... Godzilla and Kong were getting rowdy because someone else got declared king of the monsters. They didn't appreciate that. So Jimmy, like I said, decided he would take care of it himself by using his newly rebuilt Mechanicong as you... uh, That's something you might remember, Nick, back from your second appearance. You were wondering, whatever happened to Mechanicong? And then I mentioned, well, Jimmy's rebuilding. Well, he finally did it last month. That went about as well as you would have expected. Yes. And then our other compatriot here on the island, Jet Jaguar himself, said, well, no one wants to get into the middle of that because it's got Zul and Kong. But he said, but there's something that you and Matt and Grattan can do. And we found out that Mechanicong Mark II was not the only mech that Jimmy has been working on in his spare time. There wow, was Jimmy. There was also what he called Uber Mogura. For those who don't know, Mogura is the name of a pair of robots who have appeared in a couple of Toho films. And the you, know, you might remember the first one from the Mysterian Invasion of 1956. And then the, there was another one built in 1994 to try to kill Godzilla. And again, that went about as well as you expected. Jimmy had leftover parts from both of them because they both got trashed. And whatever didn't go into Mechanicong Mark II, he cobbled together into another mech. He built a mech to do a taxi service? Well, no, it wasn't a taxi service. You said it was an Uber me- Uber. Uh, like Uber Mogra, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. the, that I, might be what we have to start doing with it because its combat abilities were limited, to say the least. Matt Gratton and I, we did our best. We uh, were at least a good enough distraction that Jimmy was able to then quell Godzilla and Kong using the Orca device that he also fixed and put into Mechanicong Mark II, and that calmed both Godzilla and Kong down, and they lost interest in fighting anybody. 
Wow. It, it seems like you have a lot more problems involved in your podcast life than we do. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of grateful for our podcast at this point. I won't even get into how I now have a uh, pseudo sister clone. So ah, uh, I did. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, aside, her, but. aside from that one adventure that we had. Oh well, yeah, that was. Yeah, I remember that. We talked about that briefly on your first appearance. The mm. that innkeeper guy was nuts, but he uh, was. Yeah. All of that to say, yes, I know all about having exciting times. <laughs> but today, like I said, we're launching our second season. And as mandated by the board, it is going to be the year of... Camera! Camera! Camera is really me. Camera is filled with me. We've been eating camera. Flames, claws, breath, scales, fun. Although I think fun might be a little bit debatable, but... Yes. <laughs> but that's why I am excited to say, because I was a little bit concerned about this when I thought, great, I have to do an entire year of Gamera movies and for only four of them are good. Then I was chatting with Reverend Mafune, mm -hmm. the Monster Island chaplain, before I came here. I don't think I've met him yet. Oh, you should. He's a, he's a swell okay. guy. And he gave me this suggestion. It's like, maybe what you can do in order to get through it so you can get to the good ones is watch the MST3K episodes. And I thought, that is genius, good sir. I'm doing it. And what is it now, Jimmy? We have a voicemail from Miss Perkins. Oh, yippee skippy. The board's princess of PR. What does she have to tell us now? Congratulations, Nate, on starting your second season of the Monster Island Film Vault, and a warm Monster Island welcome to Nick Hayden and Timothy Deal. In fact, the board is extending you and the other Monster Island tourists to appear on Nate's show a special privilege. Since many kaiju fans were introduced to Gamera, the newly crowned king of the monsters, by the cult classic TV series Mystery Science Theater 3000, the board has decided that you and future guests this season will watch the MST3K episode featuring whichever classic Gamera film is being discussed on the show while Nate watches the original Japanese versions. Comparing each other's notes should make for great radio and show the full breadth of the friend to all children's legacy. Isn't that right, Gamera? <coughs> yes, you really are neat and full of uh, turtle meat. Anyway, enjoy yourselves, gentlemen, and may you find a better way forward. Avina Sane! Are you freaking kidding me? Aw, well... It doesn't sound too bad for us, at least. Yeah, I, I'm always up yeah. for some uh, mystery science theater. Look at the bright side. <laughs> what bright side is that? Um, we don't have to suffer with you? Misery likes to be alone? Yeah. Is that, that's how it goes, right? That's how it goes, yeah. We'll get a unique vision of us uh, having jokes to tell you about after the fact. You're at the primary source, which is where you need to be, and we don't want to do that much work. Yeah, you're the historian. They're giving you a greater responsibility. You should feel honored by we're, this. We're the plucky sidekicks. Yeah, exactly. Just don't kick us, please. <laughs> I don't know if we can be friends anymore. Ugh, fine. Fine! I don't feel like getting shot into space, so if I want to keep this job and stay terrestrial, I don't care what you say, Jimmy. I know you say space isn't that scary, but fine, fine, fine. I'll go into the smaller screening room next to the main one. Okay, okay. But because I was required to bring my normal academic excellence to this, I did research a toku topic for this. It is going to be energy consumption in Japan. Okay. And yes, there are connections to this movie, strange as that may be. A little bit. <laughs> okay. To the screening room, gentlemen. Here we go. Woohoo! Woo Gamera is an ancient and gigantic turtle awakened by a nuclear weapon that is detonated after American fighter jets shoot down an enemy plane in the Arctic. Dr. Hadaka believes Gamera is a turtle from a legend of Atlantis, while an Eskimo chief calls him the Devil's Envoy, two stories that give Gamera an air of the supernatural. 
Regardless, Gamera is primarily a force of nature and seeks various energy sources, such as power plants, that he can drain for sustenance. However, he does briefly behave anthropomorphically when he rescues Toshio for no apparent reason. Speaking of that, the Kenny of this film is Toshio Sakurai, an animal-loving and foolhardy schoolboy who becomes obsessed with Gamera after the Titanic Terrapin saves him during an attack on a lighthouse. He constantly insists that Gamera is actually good despite obvious evidence to the contrary, and he often throws himself and others into harm's way to see Gamera. The inquisitive and intelligent zoologist Dr. Hidaka discovers Gamera and becomes the de facto expert on the titanic tortoise, going on TV news programs to disseminate information about him or assisting the JSDF in planning countermeasures against him. Aoyogi is the loyal and bold photographer who follows Dr. Hidaka to document his expeditions. The equally loyal and also intelligent Kyoko Yamamoto is Dr. Hidaka's young assistant who, well, assists him on his expeditions. Despite their prominence, both of these characters contribute little to the story. Nobuyo Sakurai is Toshio's responsible and down-to-earth older sister who is always trying to keep him in line or help others escape during Gamera's attacks. The human and kaiju plotlines are separate at the beginning of the film but quickly become unified. Gamera becomes the driving force of the character's stories and motivations. For the first, and arguably only time, Gamera is the problem. The JSDF uses high-tension wires to repel Gamera as he approaches a power plant, but he tears through them and draws energy from them. The military responds with a barrage of artillery, but it has no effect on Gamera. The JSDF considers letting the Americans kill Gamera with a nuclear strike, but this is cancelled after Dr. Hidaka says Gamera survived a nuclear explosion already and would draw more power from it. Instead, they opt to lure Gamera to a hilltop where they bombard him with cadmium freezing bombs. Once immobilized for 10 minutes, soldiers plant and detonate dynamite around Gamera, launching him down the hill. He lands on his back and is to be left there to starve, but he reveals that he can fly like a jet power flying saucer and escapes. To keep Gamera distracted, trains filled with petroleum are sent toward him, which he derails. The problem is solved by Z-Plan. Gamera is lured to Oshima Island thanks to a combination of a fiery trail of petroleum, burning tents, and the eruption of Mount Mihara. Gamera walks onto a platform where a huge capsule encloses around him and said capsule is shot into space on a course for Mars. The script by Nissan Takahashi and Yonajiro Saito is a simple, by-the-numbers kaiju story, but it has several moving parts with its large cast and parallel subplots, although these eventually come together as the movie progresses. The special effects were directed by Yonesaburo Tsukiji. The film had a 40 million yen budget, which was two-thirds the budget of a Class A feature, and was filmed on a tight shooting schedule. It was shot in black and white due to budget constraints. However, director Noriaki Yuasa says the film went slightly over budget. The six and a half foot tall, 110 pound Gamera suit was worn by multiple stuntmen who quit in quick succession, with Teruo Aragaki doing the most work. Because optical effects were too expensive, Gamera's fire breathing was created using the cheaper but more dangerous technique of placing a flamethrower in the suit's mouth. Other special effects techniques utilized in the film included miniatures, rotoscoping, and back projection. The production was beset by numerous problems. A flying Gamera prop caught fire during one sequence. The ice brought in by three trucks for the Arctic scenes melted, flooding the studio. Tsuburaya Productions was considered to complete the film, but Yuasa refused. The end result isn't on par with tokusatsu films produced by rival studio Toho, but the movie still has solid production values. The movie takes itself seriously, but still has a light tone and a moderate amount of gravity. While it alludes to fantasy elements with the mentions of Atlantis and Eskimo mythology, the movie airs a bit more on science fiction. Aside from the titular monster being a turtle, who was originally intended to be a quadruped, the film isn't experimental and instead follows the trend established by Godzilla films. To that end, it reinforces the style of said Godzilla films by adhering to the tropes established by them. 
The only possible exception is that a child character is featured as a fully-fledged supporting cast member, a foretaste of what would become the Showa Gamera series trademark. The film was made as Daiei's response to the increasingly popular Godzilla series and furthered the 1960s kaiju trend. It was also meant to recoup the losses from the failed film Nezera, which was about giant rats, and utilize some sets and props from that production. Director Yuasa wanted to make this a children's movie, but he was overwritten by Daiei's executives, so it was instead aimed at a general audience. Box office figures are unavailable, but it was a surprise hit and spawned a new franchise for Daiei when released November 27, 1965 in Japan. It was released in a heavily re-edited form by World Entertainment Corporation and Harris Associates Incorporated as Gamera, with two M's, The Invincible, December 15, 1966, making it the only Showa-era Gamera film to see a U.S. theatrical release. It was often double-billed with Knives of the Avenger or The Road to Fort Alamo. It only has a 20% score, albeit with five reviews, on Rotten Tomatoes and a 5.2 with 1,033 ratings on IMDb. Kaiju fans are generally lukewarm to negative toward it. Stuart Galbraith IV famously said, quote, Gamera movies are slow-moving, slow-witted, and almost unwatchable, end quote. But there's been a recent push to reevaluate this and the rest of the Showa series. There are two English-language versions of the movie, the first being the aforementioned Gamera the Invincible. This cut was given the Godzilla King of the Monsters 1956 treatment with newly filmed scenes of American actors inserted. Although, in its defense, these replaced the scenes of subpar American actors in the Japanese cut. Several tracks of the film's score, including the opening theme and the music at the dance party, were replaced with the pop song Gamera, again with two M's, by a band called The Moons. The Daiei logo at the beginning was replaced with the World Entertainment logo. A few shots of Gamera attacking the nuclear power plant were added. A few scenes without Gamera roars had some added. In the 1980s, Sandy Frank Film Syndication dubbed the original Japanese version. The only changes were new opening credits over a stock shot of the ocean and several characters having their names changed, with the most famous, or infamous, being Toshio becoming Kenny. There are some forces at play in the movie, but not for very long. Gamera is awakened by American and, most likely, Soviet forces in a Cold War engagement, hinting at Japan being caught between the superpowers. Legend and tradition clash with modernity with the Eskimos claiming Gamera is the devil's envoy. Gamera can be seen as an invasive species on Japan with how he negatively affects the environment. Toshio's childlike and childish love for Gamera puts him at odds with the level-headed adults. The JSDF briefly finds itself desperate enough to allow another American nuclear strike on Japanese soil. Law enforcing police clash with reveling youth while trying to evacuate the city. Only a few themes can be mined from this movie. Gamera's insatiable hunger for energy and his attacks on power plants can be seen as a commentary on Japanese energy consumption, which had increased during the Japanese economic miracle at the time and could be advocating for the development of clean energy. The world comes together to concoct and implement Z-Plan in order to defeat Gamera. In the same vein, the Japanese do everything possible to avoid the use of nuclear weapons, preparing to use science and ingenuity. Toshio's fervent but misguided love for Gamera seems to be commended by the film, while the adults see the kaiju only as a threat. All right. I've made it through the first entertaining info dump of 2021 thanks to Jimmy's subtle snark. So now let's get into the first Toku Talk of season two. Alrighty, now that we've gotten Jimmy's apparently slightly snarkier entertaining info dump out of the way, we can now get into the Toku Talk segment of the podcast. And I can already tell that you guys had a heck of a lot more fun than I did. I was uh, hearing you laugh quite often, even with earphones on and with those apparently paper-thin walls in the way. 
I'm only a little jealous. Just a little. <laughs> just a little. Well, apparently you got done faster than we did because I guess the host segments are, uh, you know, take a, a fair bit of space there. Yeah, yeah, it makes me wonder if they actually showed the entire movie. I know sometimes Joel and the guys and the bots and all of that, I know that they will edit the movies down so they can fit it into their time slot. There were a couple times where we were like, what in the world just happened? And we thought maybe they'd cut something. That's because you watched movie. Gamera. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. But there were times when like characters seemed to completely jump locations and we were like, was that in the movie or was there an edit there? Like the first one I remember was like, at one point, Kenny was in the ground, and the next moment, he was up in the Oh, by the way, his real name is Toshio? Just, yeah. Kenny. Kenny. That's that's, yeah, that's what we have to go by. Let's well, just call him Kenny from now on. I don't care what his real name we, is. We, his we, name is Kenny. Okay, we need to have a talk about Kenny. <laughs> well, but, but, but just <laughs> let me finish my, my thought earlier, because like he was on the ground one minute, and the next moment, he's up in the lighthouse. Is there any counter in the original, in the version you saw, was there a part Running where he or went stairs. up to the lighthouse? From what I can remember, because I kind of try to block this out a little bit, there is a point where he does go to the lighthouse. Apparently, his family owns the lighthouse. Okay. Okay. So from the, MSC yeah. th from the Misty version, it just looks like he teleports there. Yeah. <laughs> so Maybe what? he has superpowers. Okay. I don't know. If, if Kenny is still alive, maybe we should invite him to the island or something. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're going to tell him. It's like, we're only covering Gamera for a year. Well, at this point, apparently, he should have been in space up and visiting Gamera on Mars. So yeah. I, I don't oh, know. Oh, by the way, he was massively disappointed because Gamera came back a year later and crushed his little dreams because <laughs> oh, okay. he didn't have to become a scientist to go to bars and visit gamma anymore he just came back to earth spoiler warning well considering there are more gamma movies yeah I, unless they were all take took place in outer space which i might be okay with <laughs> granted there gamma, are some that take place in outer gamma space versus martians so uh, no. you apparently read ahead <laughs> so question though watched while, ahead i don't know I shut just, up jimmy so uh, while we're on the topic of cut off spaces, is there something where – so he's hanging out almost through the island where plan Z is and – Oh, the Z plan. Oh, Z plan. Z plan. I need Z plan. a Z plan so I can escape this movie and the rest of its sequels this season, but – we can't always get what we want. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed that in their uh, coalition of nations that was working on this thing, there wasn't a French guy. Because we were like, the Z plan is really like, the plan. This is the plan that we yes. made. Z okay, yeah. Yes. Dumb French joke, we're done. But they did make it. Hey, for us. I have a French surname, so make all the French jokes you want. <laughs> but the bots made the joke for us, so it was good. That's true. That's true. So was there a. Oh, yeah, transition? the bots. Yeah, so yeah, much, it was, it was so a lot much. of fun. You should have watched it with us. Yeah, I would uh, I would have loved to. It, would, it might be worth going to space just to see that. So question, though. Mostly serious question. So Gamera's outside the Z-Plan, and then suddenly he's in the Z-Plan in our version. Is there some transition for that? Or I don't just... understand what you're talking about. Well, he's looking at the volcano. Yeah, that, that was the thing. It was like, it was night. He, Gamera was looking at a volcano that was exploding. And, and then, then it's day. And suddenly it's day. And then they were like luring him somehow onto the metal plates that they launched him into space with. Uh, they figured out that Gamera likes fire. Oh, we know that. Yeah. Yeah. So the reporter character, I don't know if this was in your version or not. He starts everything on fire. He starts because... th lighting everything on and fire. And was like, what? Fire tr tracks him? And we're like, you've been doing that for like the last like yeah like 40 minutes i thought they lit something on the fire in order to attract him to the island in the first place yeah and then <laughs> so all of a sudden they like, managed huh? yeah, so they just did that and they got him to come back and then they lured him to the spot where plan z is supposed yeah, to happen were... so they may have not cut a whole lot out because okay. it just seemed weird this is gamera we're talking about here yeah, it was very confusing because it was literally one part, it was dark, it was night, there was a typhoon going on, and the next is like broad daylight, and I was like, is this the same location? Is this the next day? What is happening? Uh, it was very jarring. Oh, I'm sure, but you know what's just as jarring? Watching the movie! <laughs> uh, well, that's what we want. We just wondered how much was Gamera and how much was cutting. So it sounds like most of it was just Just gamma. the movie, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I would have to watch the episode again at some point. I'm sure I can watch it on my own time. <laughs> Unless the board decides that they really got to be Orwellian overlords and tell it. me what I can do in my free time. That's fair. <sighs> but anyway. So let's talk about Kenny. Okay. Well, what do you want to talk about, Kenny? Do we have to talk about Kenny? <laughs> You're the one who brought it up. <laughs> so, yes, Kenny. So Kenny. What's up with Kenny? <laughs> Kenny is in desperate need of seeing a psychologist. No, like, seriously, like. Kenny's not endearing. Kenny's like, you need to talk to someone, Kenny. 
you need a psychologist. Your obsession with turtles and rocks is beyond like cutesy. I, I, kept, I kept waiting for the rocks thing to make a comeback somehow. It was like, are they like special rocks? Or are they like the steak shaped rock? The steak shaped. <laughs> yeah. The, like why? Why he was had this thing about turtles? Where did the rocks come I from? I think he was going to build a sh- shelter for. It was. He was turtle? trying to build a shelter for. What was? Uh, what was his name in the dub? Well, it was the either, hilarious dub. It that was you either guys to... Timmy or Tibby, and it was very hard to tell because like it went back I and forth. I think if I remember correctly, it's supposed to be Tibby. Yeah, Tibby, which okay. is a gross perversion of what it is in Japanese. It's uh, his name is Chibi. Oh, okay. Oh, like okay, yeah, Chibi. That's which a, that makes more sense. Oh, uh, which. Arrow Video and their infinite wisdom decided to subtitle as Pee Wee. <laughs> okay. Well, and that's what I saw today. <laughs> I guess that kind of makes some sense because it's like a little thing. I don't know. So, so yeah, I mean. Well, start- that's what Chibi means. It, you know, like you've seen like uh, like they make Chibi figures or Chibi yeah. characters. Or, yeah. They're like little and, they, yeah. you know, they have like, like little- small bodies, big heads. They're cute. Yeah, yeah a little yeah. cute. It's, uh, I don't know if that's literally what it means. I don't speak Japanese. But no, but- it, it, it isn't. But that's. Yeah, what so it, that's what's associated with the word right right so we meet kenny and well we don't meet him we meet his family family and yeah with his 25 year old sister yes yes <laughs> and, and, who still lives at home i don't know if that's how old she actually is but she, i think she's su- supposed to be a teenager but i'm just like you're 25 okay i know we make jokes about 30 year old adults playing teenagers but i think that happened here and apparently he's like just taking turtles to school, like it's like, it's like taking like a, some delinquent. But the thing isn't drugs or goofing off or anything. It's this turtle, <laughs> and it's like, and you do a completely straight face. I'm like, this isn't. A, There's it, something wrong with your son. <laughs> <laughs> He's bringing turtles to school. It's like, it's like that Monty Python skit when they're like, sometimes I like to dress up like a mice mouse and eat cheese. You guys ever seen that one? I and have. That's, that's like that's what I felt like watching Kenny. <laughs> Yeah, like you go to like some turtle convention and be like, precious. <laughs> and the father's all like, "No son of mine's gonna be have a pet turtle. <laughs> Not gonna grow up to be some delinquent teenager turtle with mutant powers or ninja skills." And oh so yeah, like, yeah. I wrote in my I, I wrote in my notes that when Kenny is told that he has to get rid of the turtle, that he immediately disposed of him in a sewer. <laughs> and he wound up and the York. rest is history no yeah. apparently he puts him out there and then later on like tibby where are you tib like what is the turtle gonna do like the what the jokes are like well he's gonna flare <laughs> well i mean according to kenny he became gamera which we all know is bunk no he's he's in the same family they're they're family they're like <sighs> I don't, I don't, he's friends of all children, which apparently means I need Gamera, but he can kill as many millions humans as possible, but he loves me. Um, Oh yeah, that is the biggest problem here. (laughs) And now the the whole friend of all children moniker didn't get applied until later on in this franchise. He says it in in our version. He literally says he's friends of all children. Oh, okay. The the Sandy Frank dub. Yes. The infamous Sandy Frank dub. Yeah. So, question, uh, since I'm not, no kaiju expert and probably don't qualify to be on the show very well. well except you play for one on that TV. I, I bring you on because you are noobs. So, <laughs> Well, I guess that, that's true. So the, that's some of our appeal. So, question regarding that. Is this the first, and I know it's not the only, but is this the first uh, kaiju story that's got this child advocate thing going on? From what I can remember, yes, there have been children who have appeared in the movies before, but they were usually just bit parts. Uh-huh. And from here on out, it, it becomes a staple of the Gamera movies with one exception in the Showa era, which will be the next movie. And you'll start seeing them show up in some later Godzilla movies. But they are not the weird, precocious children that we are going to see in the Gamera movies. Oh, calm down. I know one of these movies is about a chapter of your life. A very interesting one. You're still a precocious adult. Anyway... <laughs> That makes. I, I got the feeling that I had seen this kind of character before, but I, I don't remember if I've. Well, 
I've seen a number of Mystery Science Theater episodes, but it's it's been some of them has been years ago, so I don't remember if I saw a previous Gamera movie or this one. But I feel like I would have remembered certain details about this one. But the idea of like the kid who's like ridiculously attached to the city destroying monsters, <laughs> like I've seen this somewhere. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a staple of these movies. It's just like and it makes bizarre. it really makes no sense in this, but that's in large part because, from what I was reading, there's a reason that this particular movie has a bit of an identity crisis, and that is because the studio just wanted to do a straight up Godzilla style monster movie, but the director Noriaki Yuasa wanted to do a children's movie. Oh, okay, yeah, so. It's, he loves interest. children, apparently, I, and was completely against doing things like showing the casualties and the monster attacks because he's like, that's what Toho does in their movies. And he th thought it was because, I read an interview with him where he said he thought it was because Toho did stuff for the military during World War II and they felt guilty. So mm. we're going to show the consequences of all of this stuff and all that. And he didn't want to do that. I feel like I would like to have seen Kenny do this sort of thing, like, like a kaiju slash Home Alone sort of movie. <laughs> Whereas, like, him and Gamera are, like, setting up traps for, like, Godzilla. <laughs> I think it would have been... I think... I could see Kenny doing that. I think we had a kid do that a, uh, a few months ago here on the island. Caused one heck of a stink. I would yeah, imagine that, uh, so. that, uh, Gamera is weird, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, you bring kids along and suddenly he's listening to them and nobody else. It's ridiculous. Having never seen Gamera, I was a little surprised. I don't know if good or bad. When you know, he's upside down on a shell, and they're like, oh, he'll die in like five minutes. And I'm like, wait, what? what? Yeah, like, how no, horrible is that? <laughs> no, on for one thing, I'm pretty sure, and you, you do your research if you want, Jimmy, correct me in your blogs, but... I'm pretty sure turtles with enough effort can get themselves, can write themselves. But then the whole idea is that, oh, we're going to flip him on his back and we're going to starve him to death. You are horrible people. No, no. I, I get it. He's a city stomping, destroying monster, but you're horrible people. Also, it's probably going to take a while. In, in the age, <laughs> in the Asian Exploration Act, they would stop on islands and they would collect turtles and throw them, like stack them upside down and just keep them and eat them. I believe that's actually true. Now, a couple hours. I'm, I'm like, that's what got me. I'm like, wait, he's like a giant turtle. Why? It would take him weeks, probably. <laughs> and then he pulled in the shell, and like the the flying saucer thing took me a lot by surprise, actually. I oh, did I, you not see that? I mean, you have the the drunk old man in the scene that was poorly lit. I had no you idea know, who what said was it's going like, on what's that? It's a UFO. No, they actually did set it up, which I was actually happy to see, but I was I did not know what that thing was. See, this this was my makes me feel. Like I have, I must have seen a Gamera movie at some point because I knew that was a Gamera thing. Yeah, I did not. They, his whole like spinning UFO thing. I mean, which is kind of cool, but I'm like, how much energy does that take? Well, apparently he just eats fire. So yeah, so I mean, so it's cool. Store it up. Which fun fact that is was a real flamethrower that they put in that costume. Nice. Because it was cheaper, more dangerous, but cheaper. Because Dia Studios, unlike Toho, Dye? didn't have the optical printer necessary to animate in rays in post-production. Okay. okay. So they just literally put a flamethrower on it to do the effect. Now, do you know... I don't know how much you know about that. And the if actual... you pay close enough attention, you'll see the little nub. Yeah. Inside yeah. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's pretty clear. I think that's on Yangre, too. You can see the... Yep. Yep. Which I've seen that like, MST3K episode, too. I, isn't that where there's a kid and they, like, dance with each other? Yeah. Uh-huh. I don't remember. That's an episode for another day, but Yongari, despite the fact that people call it the, the Korean Godzilla, or at least the South Korean Godzilla, there's a North Korean Godzilla, too. Was that from new that, Yeah, yeah it was. Early, the, early in it, or? Yeah, it was, in the, it was in the oh. first, uh, uh, like, the middle of the first season on Netflix. Uh, okay. But anyway, even though people call it the South Korean Godzilla, they took more inspiration from Gamera, let me tell mm. you. Yeah. Anyway... So, so, a question I had about the costume. Do you know if it had different, like, did, were, were there different iterations, like a version with the flamethrower? Yeah, without? you can tell. Yeah, it was kind of It depended on the shot, and that was common practice for these movies back then. That makes sense, because, like, some shots, like, you could see him, like, open his mouth, and he, he looked really nice and animated. And then there'd be other shots where he'd be walking around with his head, like, just pointed practically straight up and be like I know. that's what's going they, on there. if you want to watch the rest of these show of Gamera movies get used to that because Gamera for that for all eight of those movies half the time looks like he's staring askew at the sky <laughs> like he's had a little too much to smoke 
Uh, oh boy. So I don't know how he sees where he's going. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a whole lot to. <laughs> I feel like I can really. I mean, we're we're poking fun at a lot of the yeah. stuff because honestly, for a non kaiju person like me, there wasn't really a lot to grab onto. I was like, unlike say when we saw the, the Kong movies, there was interesting character ideas or you know other sort. Of, there was just nothing new. Here, here. you get a, a deranged child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like I, I've seen and all a bunch of stock characters, including the scientist who goes on at what I called exposition TV in New York but still speaks <laughs> Japanese. And don't get me started on all of those American actors. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. They're all terrible. I, the military commander yes. at the beginning, he looks and yes. sounds like Curly yep. from the Three Stooges. And yep. none of these people, none of these people, this happens a lot. It, Toho did it, too, in their movies. None of these people are actors. They are literally just Americans or Western white people, whatever you want to call them, who are just living in Japan. And they're like, well, we need you to fill a role. Can you do it? And they, you know, they, yeah. would, they, they would just be like a side gig, <laughs> uh, you know, a side hustle that these guys, would, a lot of them would be lawyers or something. Okay. You know? See, and it made me wonder. If I, I don't know about these guys, but I, you know, I had to wonder if any of them were actual like military officers. A lot of times they were. I tried to check to see if these guys were actual military, as I know that's been done in some of the other ones. Because they had the haircuts and they're yeah. like... And the, but I, and, but, but yeah. I wasn't able to confirm whether or not... Again, a little assignment for you, Jimmy. But, but yeah, none of them can, can emote at all. <laughs> no. It's like... Here, no, Colonel, no, I don't know what's and, happening here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then you Come had, uh, and if you watch the uh, the original Japanese version, there are points where the Japanese characters even speak English, and it sounds like you would expect it. And they put subtitles in Japanese on the side, which is a little amusing. The funniest one is the Eskimos at the beginning speak English, and I'm thinking, why do they speak English? <laughs> or are they from Alaska? I guess... I don't know. I don't maybe, know. maybe it's in Canada. Shout out to Chris Cook from One Cross Radio, my Canadian listener. So but I'm kind of with Tim. Like, you know, we watch the, the Beast, Beast, the Beast, the Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. Um, when what, last time I was here, what just happened? <laughs> it is the power of the Beast, the Beast, the Beast, the Beast. The Beast. from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. Uh, okay, but anyways, and you know, it's a pretty straightforward. But there's, you know, there's some interesting character moments. There's this movie is like a very witty script. Kenny's kind of psychotic. Um, <laughs> and, and the, the part with the train is what gets to me. Uh, He's like, I, oh. you're a homicidal serial killer, Gameron. I love you. Yeah. I love you. And then the, uh, the adult in the room, well, one of them is just like, what are you doing, kid? What, what are you doing? And then I'm going to recklessly endanger myself and the guy trying to save me. I love you, Gamera. Well, and yeah. he just like sneaks on the military bases. No one cares. Like, oh, it's Kenny. Hi, oh, Kenny. That, that's nothing. Just wait, you know, just, the sequels. I, this is why I am not looking forward to the next eight months. The sequels, it gets worse. So they. So it wow. sounds like they took the worst parts of it and just kept <laughs> and kept going it. with it. <laughs> the only one of these old Gamera movies that breaks from this formula is actually the next one because spoiler warning. This movie, surprisingly, was a gigantic hit. It made gobs of money, but they made it on a lower budget, as you can tell, because at Die, they had what they called Class A and Class B films, and the Class A movies, they got all the monies. Uh -huh. okay. Those were the prestige pictures, okay? And then they had the Class B movies that only got two-thirds of the budget that the Class A movies would get. And they put the people who were less certain, they were more untested, like the director, Mr. Yuasa, only his second movie ever. He had worked in the industry for a long time, but this was only the second movie he ever directed. So mm -hmm. he was untested. It became a hit. So then they decided, for the next one, we'll give them lots of money. We'll make it a Class A movie. And we'll get a new director and we'll do a different formula. There won't be kids in it and all of that. But that one didn't do as well. So they went back. <laughs> oh, how <laughs> ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mean, so the next one is the only one that kind of breaks from the formula. I mean, I guess... For the, all the complaints about the way the mouth moves, the design of Gamera, actually, like, if you are going to design a giant evil turtle monster, yeah, that looks like a giant it's evil good. turtle well, monster. Well, it's the funny. Nice and everything. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's funny that you bring that up because the name Gamera, it sounds cool to Americans, but it's actually kind of on the nose like a lot of monster names in Japanese. It literally just means giant turtle. Uh, okay. Because you know how the Japanese name for Godzilla is Gojira? Mm -hmm. As the raw 
is what gets translated in English as Zilla, that suffix. That's why you'll see the name Ra, R-A, show up in a bunch of monster names. Okay. Mothra, mm, okay. Gamma Ra, okay. gotcha. Batra. Gotcha. But the prefix is just Game or Kame, which means turtle. <laughs> okay. All right. So he is literally giant turtle. Well, I guess to be fair, when the Americans did a kaiju movie with ants, they just called it them. So we're well, not- yeah, they didn't even bother coming up with names. Giant Gila like- monster. Yeah. yeah, but supposedly, <laughs> story has it, Dai exec Masaichi Nagata was on an airplane because they had another movie. This was supposed to be a completely different movie, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And so their initial plans for the original movie fell through. So they're trying to figure out what to do because they'd already invested a bunch of money in making sets and props and everything for this. He was on an airplane, looked out the window, and depending on the story, either saw a cloud or an island that looked like a turtle. Hmm. And then when he got back to the studio and they're like, well, what do we do with this movie? And he said, giant flying turtle. And they said, sure. And they went with it. I think it's a little bit dubious because it sounds a lot like the story that Tomiyuki Tanaka would tell about where he got the idea for Godzilla. So, Hmm. yeah. Hmm. But originally, this was supposed to be a movie about giant rats. (laughs) Oh, okay. I I think the turtle might be better, actually. Well, it it was called Nezera, which, again, just means giant rats. (laughs) Nezera, Nezu, rats. So that was what this was supposed to be. They were initially going to go the Rouse route, and it was going to be a guy in a rat suit. Okay. So we went from Slinter to Mutant Turtles. Rats. <laughs> Rodents of unusual size. That's, I was, that's what I was trying to get. But <laughs> you're welcome. But then they decided, you know what? No, let's not do that. No, no. And then they made the decision that sank the movie. They decided, how about we use real rats on a miniature set? I'm sure, yeah, yeah. I can see why that would have sunk it. It's particularly the boats. <laughs> toy boats. Yes, toy, and uh, yeah. toy as boats. you would expect in the best laid plans of mice and men, <sighs> it went about as well as you expected because uh, two words, parasites and procreation, I'm just saying... Yeah, it did not go well. Yeah, you know, there, that's a whole to do, and Jimmy probably talked a bit about it in his entertaining info dump. But there you go. So because all of that fell through, and after many deaths of many rats, they decided that they needed to figure out something to do with what they had. So that led to what you just watched well, today. And I guess Turtle, if this is supposed to be a children's movie, Turtles are more kid-friendly. Yeah, I mean, Gamera as a creation is actually... I think relatively interesting, is it? But yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the whole story just doesn't help yeah, much. You say that, but there are a couple of other potential origins that have floated around about this movie. One of which had to do with there being a fire-propelled turtle from a 1962 TV pilot, which was a couple years before this. This was 1965. Hmm. And also uh, a story about a quote-unquote perverted turtle that appeared when women prayed at a Shinto shrine near Daiei Studios. Uh... There was a related story to that that also said that turtle would bother female bathers at Nagasaki. I might prefer the Kenny route at this point. (laughs) The what? The Kenny route. Oh, okay. There are also some mythological connections to Gamera, but I'm saving those for the good movies. Good to know. But, like, even the love story in this is not much of anything. There's a love story? Well, I mean. Barely. I mean, it's basically like reporter stalks. Oh, uh, the... uh, uh, Goddess of good luck? Yes, exactly. And it's like, I could is- use a goddess of good luck right now. I think the goddess of good luck hates me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that had absolutely nothing to do with anything else no. going on. And it didn't make it, any sense why this guy would show up at all these important government meetings. Like, I snuck in here and started things on fire just to help you. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's... <laughs> Apparently in this movie, psychosis is more contagious than COVID. It's <laughs> Which actually brings me, I should have brought this up at the beginning. I warned you, Nick, as much as I know you love the, the beast, beast. The beast. The beast. From 20,000 Fathoms. You got a little too close to him. I told you he had prehistoric COVID. <sighs> I know, and I ended up getting it from him. You got it from him. I know. And then we had a little bit of a scare with you. Oh, no. Yeah, but yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Just I was a little away. bit concerned, you especially you know, with uh, how things have been on the island for a little while. So, yeah, well, 
I'm sure the fact that I came here in an enclosed metal can underwater <laughs> kept me quite safe. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll go with that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, fun little fact, going back to Nezra, the failed production of this movie is going to be the subject of a mockudrama coming out this month in Japan. Oh, okay. interesting. Nezra 1964, and I hope to acquire a copy of it for the vault. So there's a question. Do Japanese people have nostalgia for this film? They do. Do they? Or at least Gamera in general. Oh, uh, okay. I don't, I'm not quite sure if it's as strong as it is in the United States. There's definitely a lot of nostalgia for Gamera in the United States. Mostly because of the MST3K episodes, as you saw tonight. Well, okay. I mean, that's fair. But, yeah. I don't know. It's just one of those things, like, it. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by the people who are <laughs> get invested in such things when, yeah, I just, I had a hard time, like, I, like yeah, I, I, I do feel for you, Nate, to be honest, <laughs> watching the, the non-Rift version, because there wasn't a lot for me to grab onto. There's not much direct, yeah, I mean, like, there's not mo much motivation for most people, and then the ones that have motivation don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. There's lots of scenes, we <laughs> mentioned at one point, there's lots of scenes of people yelling insistently at other characters who just ignore them. Kenny, Kenny, stop! Or get out of the. Why are you dancing? There's a monster <laughs> coming. Ah, who cares about Gamera? Yeah, it sounds a little bit like Jimmy and I on a most working days. <laughs> oh, calm down. <laughs> Although I do have to say that one like transition from like Gamera causing destruction to your <laughs> guitar riff <laughs> was pretty great. You know, the funny thing is, Jimmy mentioned this in the entertaining info dump, but there's actually kind of four cuts of this movie. There's the original Japanese version, which I had to sit through. And then you guys saw the MST3K version, but they used the Sandy Frank redub that was made in the 80s and released on VHS. And that was the Japanese version, just with a very silly dub. And then there was another version released in the US. And by the way, this is the only Showa era Gamera film that got a theatrical release in the United States. The rest of them went to TV. And it was called Gamera the Invincible. Gamera with two M's. Because apparently the U.S. distributors thought that it would be confused for the word camera. Yep. Camera. Okay. Camera. <laughs> yeah. And they cut out the terrible American scenes and put in only slightly better American <laughs> scenes. <laughs> and they took out no, wait, they, the they, 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 uh, filmed, they actually filmed brand new versions. Yes, of it's like things? King of the Godzilla, King of the Monsters, nineteen fifty. Now twenty percent better. <laughs> and uh, that's, they that's, that and then like they and whatever the whatever footage they kept, they just dubbed over that. That seems like a lot of extra work to <laughs> improve something that was not going to be. It's like putting a band aid on a gaping wound. Uh, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> and they also gave the movie a new theme song. That if I had it on my soundboard, I'd play for you, but it, it's pretty much just a highly repetitious 60s pop song that just goes, Gamera, do, 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 Gamera. Nice. That is, those are the, all the lyrics. <laughs> and that goes, that drones on for about 90 seconds. Oh, that sounds And that's what you got in the credits. Wonder, wonderful. Makes oh, you miss the Gamera song, doesn't it? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> So there was a lot of fire though in this in this movie. I guess that was good. Yeah, there's fire. There's fire. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Mm -hmm. That fire. It was, it was pretty hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we want to talk about Z Plan because the you know they do all of this stuff. I love the fact that Z -Plan. they 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 just bring up. Oh yeah, we have freeze bombs. <laughs> like, like I, I love the fact that they just have all of these secret weapons no. sitting around. Like, you have freeze, we have freeze no. bombs. I'm like, you have freeze bombs? No. I would think those would be pretty potent weapons to have. Oh, but they only freeze things for 10 minutes. <laughs> you have the worst WMD <laughs> ever. No, the great thing is about, the, about the freeze bombs is like, just some random guys like, hey, I shouldn't tell you this, it's top secret, but we have freeze bombs. He's like, oh yeah, let's use those. And they just make... Unilateral decisions, like at the coffee table. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of exposition in this movie. Oh, oh yeah. My God. And then, like, some of them are like, so doesn't even. Now that I think about it, I, had, I hadn't thought very hard about it. Um, it's Gamera. I know. Do you need so, to think so, hard about like, it? He's almost to the island, f following the fire. They're like, oh, we failed. Like, maybe we should use Z plan now. It's like, we won't have enough fuel. I'm like, how would they even use it if he's not on the island? Are they gonna have it blast off and like? <laughs> 
take him up? That's a good point. It yeah. Well, uh, and, like, we and, and use get, them now. And to get back to the freeze bombs, because they uh, they use the freeze bombs on camera, and it only works for 10 minutes, and it's the worst TV time I've ever seen, because 10 minutes passes by in about 90 seconds. <laughs> I wish I, sh- I should have timed it. But you know, I was just like, that is the fastest 10 minutes I've ever seen. This is the opposite problem of Dragon Ball Z, where 10 <laughs> minutes becomes five episodes. Uh-huh. No, one minute becomes like five episodes. It's ridiculous. So I'm just like, okay. And what was the point of the freeze bombs again? It accomplished nothing. <laughs> it's a failed attempt. And Another the, failed attempt. The, fr- the freeze bomb was actually one of the more interesting sections, I guess, because it was something new. I was a little confused. I didn't, I feel like I didn't see when the freeze bombs went off. So no, we didn't see it go off. I kept going back and forth like, wait, when does this 10 minutes thing start? <laughs> yeah. They keep yeah. talking about it. It's got to be 10 minutes. And apparently like, 10 the, minutes from what? Apparently the person in I charge of that is his daughter, right? That's who's in charge of keeping the time? I guess In a military so. operation? Yeah, go figure on that. Yeah. yeah. Will you get over it, Jimmy? I know you wish you had a freeze bomb lying around in your garage, but we don't need any WMDs on Ogasawara right now. There are laws about this. (laughs) You got your giant robots. That is skirting it, and I really mean skirting it. Okay? Let's not push our luck here. You got KMDs here, though, don't you? What are those? Kaiju's of mass destruction? Yes. (laughs) Again, skirting it. Skirting it. Okay, yes. Yeah. We have to operate on the same principle as our competition, Jurassic Park, okay? There's all kinds of permits and everything that needs to be worked out. I don't even want to think about the paperwork. No, life will find a way. Yes. Paperwork. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, so you have that. So then they decide, well, that didn't work. What's our next solution? It's like, we should use plan (laughs) Z, which implies that they had 25 other plans (laughs) that we only saw one of. Thank so you. I'm just like, Thank so like you went through 25 other plans and then this is what you landed on. And then they don't tell you what it is. Nope. It's almost like the movie, the script is self-aware enough to know that plan Z is ridiculous. <laughs> Says they wait to show you what it is until the last 10 minutes yep. of this movie, at least in the version I watched. No, it's a very, and movie. yeah. What is it? Oh, what's the solution? The Apparently the only solution that will fix our problem with Gamera, put him in a rocket and launch him to Mars. Because that's what sane people do. <laughs> they come up with ideas like put the giant turtle in the rocket and shoot it to Mars. <laughs> Welcome to the comic book universe that is Gamera's habitat. So one of my favorite jokes from uh, the Misty thing was when they were launching him this, into space, Crow asked Joel, hey, does this look familiar, Joel? And they start saying it in the not too distant future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the other thing. It, I think that may have inspired that particular clause in my contract. <laughs> it's possible. I do have one question, though, about Plan Z. One question. Well, yeah. Only one? <laughs> At least one right now. We've seen Gamera tear apart buildings and stuff. What did they put Gamera in to keep him in a rocket? Like, what is that thing made out of? Adamantium? I uh, guess. Uh, sure. Cake? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Kenny, this movie is not smart enough to ask these questions. Like, Kenny, we're sending him to Mars. He's going to the sun. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> And I thought my joke about him coming back and crushing Kenny's dreams of becoming a scientist a year later was mean. <laughs> oh, man. I don't actually hate Kenny that badly, but he's just so easy to pick on. Yeah, he's, he's a good I, target. I feel like Elon because Musk he should may have his grown, Mars thing, Plan Z. I think that'd be wonderful. That's because he may have grown up to become a serial killer or a crazy radical environmentalist no, I think or something. I, I think he's just like the crazy cat lady, but he just has turtles everywhere so he's the crazy cat dude yeah no crazy turtle dude oh yeah he just yeah right. he's just like you know it's like a terrarium like he makes his like he lives in a terrarium so like he literally has like hundreds of turtles at his beck and command and he's just trying to call back gamera with all the turtles singing they don't really sing very <laughs> i'm sorry i'm done <laughs> I was gonna say, how long are you gonna go with this neck <laughs> this sounds eerily similar to your theory about susan and kong and king kong escape oh that was great yeah i forgot about about susan. uh her <laughs> commanding. Uh, taking com- commanding kong because he just listens to whatever she says and then hey, taking I'm over a small you, third world country there needs to be a variety 
of short stories or web comics or something in detailing these spinoffs. Uh, here's now, the thing. W- welcome here's to my the, world, Nate. <laughs> yeah, I, I deal with. What this are you on... talking about? I've known Nick about as long as you. So. I, I know, but I have to deal with this kind of Every insanity podcast. on on our podcast. Why all the do you time. think you're my friend? <laughs> well, true. <laughs> true. But no, uh, I I don't know about that because uh, Gamera. He cheats on Kenny, I'm just saying, because he has a lot of these kids as friends and he's saving them or having them well, you know, help him save the world from aliens or something like that. Yes, I know for a hot minute you were one of them. You told that to Monsters versus Men because someone else besides me had that crazy theory. I feel like uh, in that case, the Gamera and the Doctor might actually get along pretty well. You know, they both have their own like companions, human companions, then all the time. It sounds like. Well, then maybe you can find something worth watching in the sequels. I don't know. Well, not necessarily. But <laughs> now, okay, no, another question. I, I well, I have two questions, but three, <laughs> three questions. <laughs> ah, 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 ah. We'll start with the one that's more relevant to what we were just talking about. In the other Gamera movies, is that when he becomes more of a guardian? It's a, like I know Wait, they friend to all children. Yeah, yeah, they start because I noticed what, they start. He starts shifting in that direction, starting with the next movie, and then the, the third movie in this series, uh, which is Gamma versus Gauss, is where the formula starts to solidify. And then I think around movie four or five, they just throw in a Gamma song sung by a choir of children to announce his coming. Okay. Which is where the inspiration for the MST3K version came from. Gotcha. So basically, is it the next movie or is the other one where it becomes like it's always... I would say Gamma versus Gauss because there's no kids in the next one. Well, I mean, like when he starts, it always be like Gamma versus someone. Oh, yeah. The next one's when they say because the next one's Gamma versus Barugon. Not Barugon. Barugon. It's a U, not an A. Gotcha. Because there's a Barugon. We have a Barugon on the island. Okay. Second question. And... I don't know this show because I don't, well, I don't watch South Park, but I kept having to ask myself, is there any inspiration between the Kenny and South Park? I have no idea. Uh, Okay. I have no idea. Although I can tell you right now, there are people who wish the kids in these movies would die, but (laughs) (sighs) it just, yeah, probably not. That, That thought crossed my mind. So anyway. No, Jimmy, I do not wish death upon you just because you were one of those kids. I'm sure he has got very fond memories of it. J- Jimmy's lived a colorful life, probably even if more you- colorful than ours. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad you've got warmer memories for that than your, your war in space. Most definitely, but uh, he's saving those for when we get to that movie. Okay, gotcha. Um, all right, well, did you have anything else we needed to cover here, I Nick? I think that's all I've got. Yes. That's all we got. What, okay. What, what else can we say? This movie was not great. Yeah, it's not. It's it's not. Okay, I'll be nice. I will be nice. I will grant it this. It's not terrible. I've seen it's, worse movies. It, on there MC3K. are worse <laughs> movies. There <laughs> like are the, worse movies out there. there, but it is freakishly mediocre. I feel like <laughs> freakishly <laughs> me- mediocre. That's accurate. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that should be a rating from now on. Like. <laughs> freakishly mediocre. I'm just Rated, saying. I'm mediocre. just saying. Compared to what comes after this, particularly when you get to the 70s, uh, you'll be missing this one. But you guys don't necessarily have to watch those. You just have to listen to me talk about them. Okay. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Or you could watch the MST3K episodes. That might do it. We wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. Yeah. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. Not all heroes wear capes. I need a cape. Uh, (laughs) I'm owed a cape. I had a cape. I had a cape at one point. I had a cape when you came here, but uh, the board took my cape away. Aw. I'm a little upset. I'm a little upset. Apparently, one of them decided it would look better on him. Didn't appreciate me having a cape. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next step in this process will be getting to the toku topic. I've gotten a lot of comments on how great MIFV sounds, and that's all thanks to Sweetwater Sound. Whether you're a podcaster, musician, or singer, Sweetwater has the gear that will make your inner audiophile squee with delight. They have the best selection from all the best brands. More importantly, their customer service is light years beyond, well, everyone else's. 
They offer fast and free shipping in the continental U.S., free tech support, free two-year warranties, and 48-month payment plans. Whatever your audio needs, Sweetwater is your one-stop shop. Visit their website, Sweetwater.com, to learn more and find your next favorite audio gear. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the Toku topic, which, as I said at the beginning, is energy consumption in Japan. Because believe it or not, there is a pair of essayists who actually try to find substance in this movie. And when I read this particular chapter of their book, which is called Japan's Green Monsters, so it's Rhodes and McCorkle, okay. the names of the authors of this book. I've used this book before, actually, in some previous episodes. I decided, you know what? This sounds like the topic to use for this episode. I even dusted off some, shall we say, old notes from my previous podcast life to go along with this. But basically, their argument is that Gamera is an out-of-control processing plant that is destroying nature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think an English person could say that. I don't think the movie supports that. When you say people... English, you mean like English professor, English no, like Yeah, like that... literary people, like yeah. me, might say Did that. Did you for... make that connection watching the no. movie today? No, what I could say is if you wanted to make so, use the movie to jump off on anything, I could see jumping off on that. I don't think anyone making the movie had that behind what they were making. That is not what Rhodes and McCorkle say, though. So why is that? What what do they? How do they prove? I mean, obviously, well, the, their chapter went into a lot of things that had to do with invasive species and all kinds of other nature related things. But I latched onto uh, the energy angle that they were going at because that was the title of their essay in this particular chapter. I, I mean, Gamera does, you know, he goes to power plants, geothermal plants and stuff and sucks up all the fire. That was basically their argument is that he is constantly consuming energy mm -hmm. and that taps into, as we'll get into, uh, some very real cultural things that Japan has to deal with. And then I, again, I'll be interested to hear, but I suppose it's possible that it's just kind of in the zeitgeist of the cultural moment. And so it's just like, oh, what would you do with this guy? Oh, let him eat up the energy sort of thing. Yeah, um, that seems more natural than saying he's supposed to be a direct one-to-one -one representation. Mm -hmm. Well, the, their argument is that, and maybe it didn't come through in the version that you guys watched today, <laughs> but there are actually are lines in the Japanese version where he is described as being akin to a power plant. Okay. You know, constantly consuming materials and all of that. Okay, well, let's see here. What, here what, what, well, the, one of then. the they're, one of the big reasons they bring it up is, as you pointed out, geothermal plants. Yes. So Gamera attacks a geothermal plants. Would they even like make a giant deal of explain what that is? Because apparently, it wasn't common knowledge to the viewers. It, uh, yeah. At this point, and this is one of the things that they were bringing up is they argued that Yuasa and his crew were bringing that up because geothermal power is clean energy and it's efficient. But it's difficult to implement. And at this point, 1965, there were no geothermal plants in Japan. Okay. So the fact that they had it in the movie was, I don't want to say wishful thinking. It was more like this is a, an ideal thing that yeah. we want to see. Yeah. And then a year later in 1966, the first one opened. Okay. So it was, it was I guess you could say forward thinking. The problem, as is very common in Japan with a lot of things in terms of Japanese culture, is it's a bit of a catch-22. Geothermal power is a double-edged sword. The, it's clean and renewable, like I said, but Japan's geology, which is what makes geothermal power possible, is also what causes earthquakes in Japan. Which are the earthquakes in this thing? I mean, he is an earthquake. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, but that's a very Japanese thing with kaiju. They're essentially walking, living natural disasters. Yeah. And Japan's a very disaster-prone country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, something we'll get into with this. <laughs> and the line from... This essay said uh, Mother Nature is a harsh mistress in reference to this. So, as I mentioned, Gamera, according to these two, at least in this film, not so much in the later ones, is a living processing plant constantly and greedily consuming natural resources, as we see with him yep. eating fire. Yep. And that is a thing that stays. The whole fire eating thing is, still, is a thing for okay. pretty much the entire franchise. And we do occasionally have to feed him fire. Well, I don't, but yeah. you know, the crews around here have to feed him fire, Exciting. keep him happy. 
American flamethrowers, as giant monster messages would say. Uh, there's even a line from a Professor Murase, you know, uh, Dr. Exposition, I think yeah. is a <laughs> Gamera welcomes flames. Oh, no, I called him. Uh, I called him uh, Professor KFC. I think that's yep, the, that, that was the, the that was yeah, Dr. Joke. Exposition yep, and yep. Professor KFC. Yep. Yeah. Colonel Sanders. The Colonel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A Gamera welcomes flames. Radioactivity would make him happy. We don't feed him radioactivity. We give that to Godzilla. Yeah. Because Gamera was apparently a radioactivity hipster. He was eating radioactivity before Godzilla was. Ooh. Yeah. In fact, Hidaka theorizes that Gamera gets angry because of a lack of energy. Then Gamera causes widespread destruction after consuming all the energy sources in sight. It's possible Yuasa saw Japan's huge economic growth in the 1960s, the Japanese economic miracle, yep. which I've mentioned several times on this show mm-hmm. and in other places. This was the beginnings of it. They were Japan was in the thick of it. And so there's a lot of art that is making commentary yes. on that. So that's kind of the crux of their argument. They also mention in the same essay, the Kappa. Have you guys ever heard of Kappas? I don't know. No. They are Japanese folkloric creatures, and they had insatiable appetites, and they would consume fish and cause widespread tidal disruptions and flooding when they were displeased, which Gamera does. also does. They also, according to Japanese folklore, would eat children, which they don't have Gamera do, nope. much to the chagrin of many people who watch this movie. <laughs> but no, yeah, it looked like for a minute Gamera was going to eat Kenny at the lighthouse, but uh, nope, he just caught him instead. Yeah. And in that in regard, furthered his uh, destructiveness by allowing Kenny to live. Yes. <laughs> but the thing is, just like I said, so they're arguing that he's unchecked consumption of natural resources, which disrupts nature and all of that. And that does play into a very real thing that is going on in Japan, which has to do with their energy consumption and their energy independence. Because, you know, as Americans, I think we take it a little bit for granted. And trust me, I've had to learn to adjust a little bit living here in Ogasawara. Japan's does not have nearly the level of energy independence as most other first world countries. So Japan has struggled for decades with their energy independence, like I said, because it's an island nation with few domestic resources. Because of this, Japan imports most of its energy. In fact, in 2010, Japan imported 187 megatons of coal, which was 20% of the world's coal imports and 99 billion, billion with a B, cubic meters of natural gas, which was 12.1% of the world's gas imports. And then in 2014, it was fifth in the world for energy production behind the U.S., China, Russia, and India. Wow. Notice how those are all countries with much larger populations. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or they're just much larger countries, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Japan once generated 30% of its electricity using nuclear power, and this is one of the biggest catch-22s in the entire issue here with energy. It had the third highest number of electricity-generating reactors with 53 behind the U.S. and France. Oh, France has come back now. Z-Plan. Z-Plan. <laughs> yeah. But since the Fukushima disaster, it has been shutting down its nuclear plants out of safety concerns. Again, going back to the fact that because of their geology, mm-hmm. They're disaster-prone, earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And what was a huge factor in the Fukushima disaster? An earthquake. And as you can imagine, this has put considerable strain on the country. Electricity is expensive to begin with, and it's only gotten worse since then. As nuclear power has decreased, fossil fuel usage has increased. And a big reason why it's a problem is another thing that plagues Japan a lot is typhoons. Mm Mm-hmm. So coastal flooding and all that, and you have to have nuclear power plants near a water source so they can cool it. Yeah. So again, it goes back to because another part of the issue with Fukushima was a tidal wave, a tsunami. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah, it's complicated to say the least. We'll get into that. So Japan's energy consumption, here we go, doubled every five years from the end of the war to the 1990s. Wow. So... At the point that this movie was being made, they were in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. From 1960 to 1972, its consumption outgrew its GNP, its gross national product. 
By 1976, Japan consumed 6% of the world's energy supplies with only 3% of the world population. I know that's a lot of numbers, but I hope that's all making sense to everybody here. Yeah, it sounds very Japan. They're very technologically driven, but at the same mm -hmm. time, yeah, it makes sense. They have limited resources. I mean, island nation. Yeah, it is the fourth highest user of solar power behind Germany, Italy, and China, but solar energy is just not quite as viable as it needs to be, particularly in a country like Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, solar energy seems to be very, I mean, I'm no expert, but it seems like it's mostly good for small community, like yeah. a farm, that kind of yeah. kind of deal. It makes sense for that, but when you try to, for a giant here's city. I can say, because I'm, I'm not an expert either, you know, that's what I have you around for, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, that's an area of engineering you're not an expert in either? Oh, I guess you don't know everything. Scotty, you are not. But anyway, yeah, I'm not an expert either, but having it on that large of a scale just isn't viable right now. Um, as a consequence of the Fukushima disaster, mm -hmm. efforts were made to liberalize the electricity supply market. One was the feed-in tariff scheme, which encouraged utilities and companies to invest and purchase renewable energy sources. And then METI, which is the Department of Energy in Japan, encouraged this by setting prices as renewables. Small businesses can now select from 250 companies selling electricity and wholesale electricity. In other words, it deregulated power companies so consumers can get their electricity from the lowest bidder. However, and I will admit some of this may be a little bit out of date now, talking to you, Kyo Itoshi, feel free to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> However, in 2015, the Japanese government released a proposal that would revive nuclear calling for an increase of 20% by 2030. I'm not 100% sure if that's still going on right now. This reverses a previous decision by the LDP or the Liberal Democratic Party and claims to be aiming for a, quote, realistic and balanced energy structure, end quote. But another reason why the geothermal plant is significant in this movie is because geothermal energy is one of the go-to supplies that the Japanese are trying to develop. Especially since Fukushima. Japan has 18 geothermal plants and the world's third largest geothermal reserves. METI is looking into over 40 possible locations for more geothermal plants. But like I said, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Japan has gone from getting half of its electricity from coal in 1950 to half from oil in 2001. And this has only increased. However, thanks to the oil crises of 1973 and 1979, oh, that sounds a little bit familiar. Yes. I talked about those. Japan did decrease its oil consumption slightly, like most other people had to. Yeah. Japan's energy self-sufficiency dropped from 19.9% in 2010 to 6% in 2014. Oh. This ranks it 33rd in the world when the incredibly small Luxembourg, there's a very oblique deep cut MST3K reference for you, is 34th. This makes the country vulnerable to the influences of international situations when acquiring resources. And I can only imagine what COVID land <laughs> has done to all of that. Japan's also considered go uh, using hydrogen. It's a good alternative. It's clean, but it requires a lot of infrastructure. So it's expensive to get it started up. And it, so that won't be viable for years. It's also... Highly flammable. This is a thing I hear a lot when people talk about using hydrogen as energy. They keep talking about like what's you know, things will blow up like the Hindenburg. And I've heard some people try to explain. It's like, no, it's not going to work quite like that. But there is the concern, the concern that yep. it's flammable. So it could be potentially dangerous in high, in urban areas. And I mentioned coal. Coal is abundant and cheap, but it's dirty and they want clean energy. Mm -hmm. So they've also started looking for hydrothermal deposits on the seafloor as well as oil and natural gas for offshore drilling. And they also have tried offshore wind farms. So they're doing pretty much anything in their power, in mm -hmm. their ability to be energy independent. And because of that, they've gotten very good at energy conservation. Makes sense. Yeah. Which, as I said at the beginning of this segment, does feed into this movie. Because if you listen to Rhodes and McCorkle, this movie is about energy consumption and unchecked yeah. energy consumption. So, with all of that in mind, uh, what do you guys think? Well, I imagine the, the kids that this movie was apparently made for would be really appreciative of this discussion of <laughs> yeah. 
Japanese energy management. Yeah. No, I, I, I was going into this thinking this is not going to be the most exciting topic, but yeah, I got to do it anyway. <laughs> well, what, what, I guess what I mean by that is I'm speaking a little tongue in cheek because like we're hearing two different things. Like if this movie was made for kids, then I can't imagine that he was certainly informed by energy stuff going on. For those who listen to our podcast, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that we are very much against like death of the author stuff. And usually the clear implication of what the story is about is probably what the story is actually about and not what someone else is bringing to it. Now that said, obviously we did not live in Japan in the 1960s. So maybe this would have been on the mind, but it just seems a weird thing. Like unless, well, I mean, I guess here, I guess here's the thing. I mean, people do make movies like little feet, which is about penguins on one hand, but it's also happy feet, happy 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 feet, feet, happy feet, which is glad I caught it. Yeah, be glad Nick caught it and not Jimmy. Right, right. But a movie that's about it seems to be about penguins is actually about environmentalism. Yeah, and I wonder well, if that's true. I, I wonder whether it's I guess I'd lean towards kinda of like Tim, more that it's it could have been kind of just in the background, this whole, you know, the energy stuff. And I wonder how much it's just it's more fun to film things with fire and plants and the cutting it. I mean, because you can say, oh, well, they didn't have a geothermal plant and that's wishful thinking, but they also didn't have a freeze bomb at the time in the history. And <laughs> that's not wishful thinking. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. And so I think it's certainly, you know, them playing up with. Eyes nice to meet you. <laughs> there. <laughs> Your token. Thank you. Mr. Freeze reference. I was. And you know what? Looking for it. You know what? I will gladly take it. Yeah. I will gladly take it. Yeah. You should. <laughs> but yeah, I I guess I have a hard time thinking that was like purposeful. Like I want to say these things. I'm not against it being like, oh look, this is in the background, you know, Godzilla did this nuclear thing, so let's play around with power and stuff like that with this gam- gamma thing. But I I guess I and maybe I'm just skeptical. I, I somewhat doubt that that was like my subtext is this, thing, you know, <laughs> as opposed to being more like, well, nuclear power is kind of cool in these monster movies, so we'll use other power stuff. And it like and fire is always nice, and we can't do ray, be, you know, ray things. And it's cheap to film on power plants versus in city. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, 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 I lean. If I may to- put my my grad school hat on here for a second, I, I get the impression that they don't come out and say this, but I think the idea that they're getting at is that it may have not been intentional, but it was part of the zeitgeist at the I, I time. Think I can buy so that. it was coming through without them necessarily thinking about it. Now, the way that they phrased some of the things they said in their essay made it sound like it was supposed to be intentional, but I've read interviews of Noriyaki Yuasa, mm. and he says nothing about that at all. No, that's very different than Honda saying stuff like Brotherhood of Man. So yeah, you know, now, with all... Ashiro Honda, it was very purposeful. It was yeah. very intentional. You watch, mm. you'll find out, Tim, if you ever watch the original Gojira, it is very intentional. Sure. The subtext and text <laughs> in that movie. So, well, And you can usually tell in a, when a movie, if they're trying... <sighs> I don't know if they're trying to be intentional, but there's usually something, it's very intangible sort of quality of like, this is meant to be taken at a deeper level. Like King Kong, there's a lot going on thematically in in King Kong that Mm -hmm. I think is reasonable to read into, not read into, extrapolate, extrapolate from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we did, which we did, which we did. Yeah. I'm with Nick. Yeah. It makes sense to see it within part of a zeitgeist of like, this was kind of in the culture at the time. So it, in form some ways. I wonder but. if it's also just in the culture of kaiju movies at the time, too. Mm. I mean, just sort of yeah. things. I mean, it, 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 again, it goes back to the idea that Japan's a disaster prone country and those disasters threaten their power plants. Yeah. Because they're located in areas that, on one hand, make it possible for them to generate the energy, but also make them vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So, how many films into the Godzilla series were out by the time this movie came out? Uh, you would ask me that. I believe 1965, you had five. Okay, so at that point, did the Godzilla movies have a habit of the eating nuclear power or that kind of stuff? Not eating nuclear power. That came later in the Godzilla series. That started more in the 80s. Okay. But Godzilla did start off as this atomic allegory. True. And 
by this point, he had evolved to embody different things, which Rhodes and McCorkle also argued Gamera is multifaceted and represented different things. They make that argument, but I don't think it quite fits in this regard. Later, Gamera came to mean different things. But at this point, Godzilla had gone from nuclear allegory to a uh, force of nature. The original King Kong versus Godzilla was a satire of mm, okay. commercialism. Again, tapping into the Japanese economic miracle and what was going on at that time. So, but he was still more or less the force of nature, but the movie itself is a satire. So at this point, he was still the force of nature. Although at this... No, actually, at this point, he had... Actually, it might have been six Godzilla movies. Not a thing, but I keep forgetting there were two in 1964. <laughs> but at this point, he had started to make his shift to being the hero. Okay. I mean, I had wondered when we first saw the nuclear plane crash as a result of... Like, you know, that was something war. that I wish we had brought up. That was actually something that was really interesting, that they tapped directly into Cold War tensions, mm -hmm. which the Godzilla films didn't really do until the 80s. Well, and I thought, I, for a minute, I thought that was kind of the angle this this particular kaiju movie was going to go in. Like, Gamera was woken up as a result of war, and so we should seek peace. Or, like, again, another comment on yeah. nuclear arms race. Which is yeah. why I do find it a little bit interesting that you had this worldwide coalition that comes together to do Plan Z. Yeah. Z Plan. And they met, They specifically mentioned, at least in the version I watched, that they had the Americans and the Russians. And I'm thinking, they caused this problem <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning. Well, the because... It's at least implied that the Americans are fighting Soviet planes that have the nuclear device. Yeah. It's never laid out who exactly yeah. the Americans shut down. Yeah. It's implied to be the Soviets because you know, that's the most logical choice. But it, that's, again, a very Japanese thing, again, that you, you developed a lot more in the 80s Godzilla films where Japan feels like they're caught in the middle between the two superpowers in the Cold War. But, but it is interesting that they introduced the element at the beginning and then kind of dropped it, which yeah. kind of is one of the aspects that makes this movie feel like kind of a mishmash mm -hmm. of a lot of kaiju ideas. Mm -hmm. well, I wonder if that's you know, part of the problem. Even if there was supposed to be this subtext, is that the movie's all over the place, and so it never gets delivered. Yeah. And so like if you basically have to, you have to make lots of effort to even do that and i guess you can connect the dots okay i'm that and that and that but the movie itself is not a natural i don't know natural it's not a you know it just isn't like oh yeah this is what we, you know you get done with the movie like oh yeah this is what this is about you just get down and be like okay now what <laughs> yeah and i think that might actually be closer to what you're talking about maybe the fact that these two essayists were pulling so many different ideas from this movie just this one movie it's because the script is really scatterbrained. Yeah, it is. And you know, yeah. it's just full of things that you could potentially interpret, but it never really latches onto any of them. The energy consumption thing is probably the one it latches onto the most. Yeah, it would be, if you're going to make an argument, that would be the best of the ones yeah. you're going to make. Yeah, as, uh, compared to talking about nuclear power and nature and yeah. Cold War tensions and all the other things that I've mentioned, invasive species. Yeah, yeah. You know, they made the argument like this is one of the few kaiju movies that deals with invasive species. I was like, okay. If they did, they did it for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they were done. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think they uh, honestly give this one a little too much. I, I, I think I think they've overtook things that were just there for in the general what's going on in culture and what you throw in the, this sort of movie. And maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I wasn't there at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, we are the dirty, dirty modern Americans looking at this movie right now, which is one of the foundational points of this podcast. We are not a film review podcast. We're a film appreciation podcast. And one of the things you have to take into consideration, you know all about this, Tim, having studied film, mm -hmm. that you have to look at particularly classic films and doubly so with foreign classic films. I mean, if classic film or foreign film by itself, you already have to look at it in a different context. But when it's both, you really have to. We're not the original intended audience. Mm -hmm. Sure. So you have to look at it through the lens of, as best you can, you can't fully put yourself there. You know, and this is one of the things I strive to do with this podcast, to bridge that gap, to show people this is what the original audience at that time and at that place may have gotten out of it. Mm -hmm. And to read other things into it even though I know there's plenty of literary theory and criticism out there that would do it, I think you veer into dubious territory when you start to do that. Now, if you contextualize it by saying, I'm bringing up ideas that are 
as far as we can tell, universal. Yeah. I think you can do that. You and I used to write that. Christian devotionals. Yeah, uh, I still do actually, and we'll we we'll oftentimes we'd use movies, and clearly. Those movies, movies, those creators of those movies are not intending well, their applicable. stories to be taken. Yeah, they're applicable. Yeah. So you have to take application into consideration as well. But when it comes to stuff like this, again, context is king. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one reason why I was asking about like what was going on with Godzilla and Kaiju movies in general at the time. I was kind of curious, how was this movie informed by not just what's happening in Japan, but what other Kaiju movies were doing? Yeah, this was made on the cusp of the kaiju boom. I will tell you that. I'll probably get into it a little bit more in some later episodes. Like, in particular, 1967 was called The Year of the Kaiju. Because every major studio in Japan released a kaiju movie. Mm. Including ones that had never done it before. (laughs) And in some cases, they released more than one. (laughs) Pretty much, when you get to about the mid to late 60s, Kaiju in Japan were like superheroes are in the United States now. They were okay. getting cranked out all over the place. They were in the movie theater. They were on TV. They were showing up everywhere. You couldn't yep. get away from them. And then, much like I expect superheroes, unfortunately, will do in the United States, people got burnt out on them, and they moved on to other things. Yep. And they haven't quite made the resurgence back to that level of popularity ever since. Oh, they do show up in, like... Even in anime from here, time to time. And I don't just mean like the Godzilla anime. I mean like like in Naruto uh, mm-hmm. or Naruto. There's sometimes some interesting spirit things, which are essentially giant kaiju. I don't remember what they're called, but... I don't recall either. I haven't gotten that far into Naruto yet. Yeah, it's yeah, toward the end. It, they show up in there. And they're in like, uh, I guess you could say in Legend of Korra. Mm-hmm. there's some of that kind of stuff or even in the very end of avatar very last airbender avatar, yeah. but i guess that's not that's more an american uh made production that's mm-hmm. inspired by asian stuff but hey it comes full circle yeah because close. without king kong there would be no kaiju that's true so it's only fair there would also not be a stay puff marshmallow man yes and the stay puff marshmallow man is a kaiju fight me <laughs> <laughs> fight me I'm, okay I'm, I'm sure he's quite uh, delicious too. I would know we don't have him here on the island. Oh, okay. that's probably you know, good. Uh, the whole you know being the embodiment of Gozer the Destroyer and all that. Yeah, we're a little nervous about that. Uh, good point. Good point. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've milked that about as much as possible because I'm telling you, I went through two English departments in my schooling, and let me tell you, English majors love finding things that I'm not 100 percent sure are there, particularly oh, when it's a movie like this. <laughs> but maybe I'm being a little too harsh. <laughs> you should read my dissertation on green eggs and ham. Oh, I'm sure it's brilliant yeah, it because brilliant. you're Nick Hayden. <laughs> it's always brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read this, Tim? I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you're the beta reader in, for this. In, in, in part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just a summary at this point. <laughs> uh, oh, so it's just your abstract? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. I, know how that, uh, I know how that all works. I didn't have to write an abstract for anything I wrote, though. It's a little different in the English department compared to other things, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I think we can now move on to... What is it now, Jimmy? You're kidding me. The Princess of PR has a little something from the board that they are requiring that I read. Normally, we would do this before the show, but sure, bring it in. All right, so what ridiculousness do we have today? Greetings to all our distinguished guests and residents of Monster Island. Oh, I guess it goes to you guys. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you to all who serve and thrive here on our humble corner of the world. A very special thank you must go to the dynamic duo of Nate Marchland. Really, guys? Really, Miss Perkins? You couldn't bother to spell check this? You disappoint me. And James B. Morgan, host of the MIFV podcast. Clarification, I'm the host, he's the producer. Okay, this is like a Tim Taylor, Al Borland thing. He assists me. Anyway, it is with great excitement the Monster Island Board of Directors would like to declare 2021 the year of Gamera. Yeah, I know all about this already. And bestow upon him the title of, oh, apparently they upgraded it now, one true king of the monsters. You sure you guys want to do this? That already caused a little bit of commotion. 
Do we have to fire up the robots again, Jimmy? Okay, I'm glad to hear you have them at the ready. All right. Hopefully, Mogura has all of its weapons in now. Oh, excuse me. Uber Mogura. When he's not taxiing things, apparently. This, of course, was not an easy decision. But thanks to the immense popularity of the Aero Video Gamera Collection released last year, the board felt it appropriate to honor our favorite fire-breathing Terrapin with the title and celebration he so richly deserves. To our employees and volunteers, when interacting with Gamera over the next year, please show your appreciation in a respectful and honorable way. A private dinner party, huh, will be held on Friday, January 15th at the Allison Adams Grand Ballroom to help ring in the new year and thus momentous occasion. Okay, this is news to me. Invitations have already been sent out to those the board thought might want to make the most of the experience. Hmm. As always, thank you one and all for being the best part of living and working here on Monster Island. We would not see a better way forward without you. Cheers, and here's to an exciting and eventful 2021. Signed, the Monster Island Board of Directors. Wow, that's very official. Yeah. It is. It is. Got the their signature and everything on nice. it. So, uh, there's that. All right. There then. you go. I uh, wonder to if uh, I'm on the camera. guest list. Yeah, congrats to the camera, then, yeah. I guess. Uh, hopefully, uh, the other monsters will appreciate that title. Well, like I said, Godzilla and Kong don't appreciate it. Yeah. Hmm. But, uh, you might have well, new- when you have Arrow Video making trailers for their Blu-ray collection that literally says, The King is Dead, Long Live Gamera, hmm, it might go to a certain turtle's head. but anyway now we come to a very important segment of the show which i was trying to get to before we were interrupted by this announcement the patreon shout outs ah yes travis alexander michael hamilton chris cook Eli Harris! Danny DeMana! Bex from Redeemed! Otaku! I hope that was as invigorating for you guys as it was for me. <laughs> I'm ready to go now. Let's do it. I'm trying to ready to eat some fire. <laughs> I, 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 could, uh, I could chew glass and spit nails and eat fire! <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Since we're at that point in the show, I shall let everybody know that... With this being season two, what our next episodes are going to be. My next episode will be a continuation of my mini sewed series. Well, in this case, the extended mini sewed series. I will be looking at Submersion of Japan, also known as Japan Sinks, from 1973, which is not a kaiju movie. It is actually a disaster movie, but it was Toho's biggest hit of that year, and... They tried to spawn a franchise off of it. I'm not kidding. Based on a Japanese novel, I will be joined by YouTuber, podcaster, and amateur filmmaker Adam Noyes for that one. I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. It'll be a very different thing. In some ways, Submersion of Japan is like a kaiju movie with no kaiju. Okay. Well, we wish you a flood of success. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Pun times, everyone. Pun times. Yes. And then... The Year of Gamera will be continuing, much to my chagrin, with the first sequel that we talked about a bit tonight, Gamera vs. Barugan from 1966. It is also an MST3K episode, and my misties for that episode will be our friends Joe and Joy Metter. They will be making yet another appearance on the show because Joe is one of the biggest Mystery Science Theater fans I know. So it was only appropriate to have the two of them on. Yes. I'm All still right. going to be angry that I'm not watching them. <laughs> yes. Maybe you need to work on renegotiating your contract. I think I might have to. We have to get a hold of some of the lawyers here on the island or something. I'm sure the board's got an army of lawyers that I could <laughs> try to talk to at some point. <laughs> you tried already? Drat. <sighs> 
Nice try anyway, Jimmy. I appreciate that. Contrary to popular belief, you and I are actually friends, despite all the badgering we do to each other. Aw. Yeah. Good-natured ribbing. (laughs) And now we come to another important segment that sometimes I forget to do, but it's very important because no episode of the Monster Island Film Vault would be complete without it. It's time for some shameless self-promotion. Go for it, gentlemen. Oh, well, we can do that. Yeah, go for it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, so we've referenced our own podcast. Our main one is called Derailed Trains of Thought. We talk about all manner of storytelling for the creator and consumer. There's a fair bit of talk about Lost on there, but if you really want to hear us talk about Lost, that's for our spinoff podcast, The Weekly Hijack. Where we watch an episode and instantaneously talk about it. We're currently going through Lost. This is a rewatch for us, so it's full of spoilers. But we're in the middle of season three. I believe she should still be in three by the time this episode comes out. We're looking forward to tackling season four. We have to go back. We have to go back. So, So, yeah, we go back to a different island. A different island. Yeah. Yes. But on Derailed Trains of Thought, we talk about all kinds of things related to story, both things about how to make a story, genre, how you read stories, how you. How you interpret stories, yeah. what are mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. ingredients of stories. So. Fun fact, the first podcast I ever appeared on was yours. So, yay, we helped you get your podcasting feet wet. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully there's something there for everyone. Okay, and just to remind everybody, if you would like to support the show on Patreon, that would be amazing. But we're now starting a new feature on the Patreon that I am calling MIFV Max, which stands for More Awesome Extras. Thank you, Danny DeManna, for that ridiculously wonderful 90-sounding name. You are amazing. So that will include uh, all kinds of new extras. You can hear bonus audio, a lot of bloopers and outtakes, tangents, because I do have to edit some things out from the live broadcast. And you'll get some behind the scenes blogs. You'll get early access to episodes. And I'm also putting some very serious thought into starting a periodic, maybe monthly video live stream for patrons only that is called MIFV Max. But in order to do that, you have to go over to our Patreon page and start supporting us for as little, I say that again, as little as $3 a month. And also, one of the things that we love here on the Monster Island Film Vault is getting feedback from our listeners. So please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever. I think I just found one that was called Pod Chaser. So it's like you know, this whole website where you can rate shows and individual episodes of podcasts. And if I see those reviews, I'll share them on the air and respond. But we also really love it when you send stuff to our mailbag or if you DM us on social media. So if you'd like to email us, it's feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Tim, right. can I uh, get a ride home, maybe? Well, unfortunately, some bald guy just blew up the submarine that I <sighs> came really? in on. So, Do I don't know. Have... I hear that this other island, though, they've got a runway on. Maybe we oh. can get a lift. Okay, yeah. I think that'd be a good idea. We got, so, we need to borrow Outrigger. Jimmy, can you help him with that? <laughs> what? I already paid you for the, my round trip last time. Why should you charge us extra? Well, uh, okay. Yeah, he drives a hard bargain. Indeed, he does. He also let you skydive the last time. That, uh, well, yeah, well, but not he, the last time, but it previous was a, time. It was a gift. Well, he did rescue me that one time, so okay. What, yeah. Do you think you give him a, like an autograph from Stuart Lim? Would that help out? Oh yeah, we can do that. We I, he gave contact yeah. with Stuart Lim. He, would, he might like to talk to him. He's all for it. Okay, we'll make a deal. Let's make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> all right. On that happy note, cue credits. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nate Marchand. If you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter where our handle is at themonsterisla1. You can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy and the Monster Island Board of Directors at Monster Isla BOD. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations. And be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, and Twitch. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wanderer on the Offensive Live Edit by B33J, Sarax, Juan Madrano, 
and Nonsensical Lexus, which is a remix of Counterattack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Open Way, Battle with the Colossus by Koatani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. All film and audio clips belong to the respective copyright holders and no infringement is intended or implied. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and or Podchaser to spread the word about the show. You can also support us by joining MIFV Max on Patreon. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara!